is Kirk Ahman. I teach two of the choirs here and some other classes. Um, we did print out a few copies of the uh, poem for the song today and um, for the piece that we'll sing. And you might want to have that uh, with you. Um, it's also been emailed to you, so feel free to access that. Um, I had the honor of introducing a very uh, special guest. This is the human being who has taught the most students at Montana State University. Professor Funk has, over 20 years, has taught 18,934 students at Montana State. Uh, he's checked all the class rolls, and we're fairly confident that's a record. So that's pretty cool. Uh, he's also the creator uh, and director of 11th and Grand, an Emmy award-winning show on PBS. Probably many of you have seen, I think, a 10-time Emmy uh, award-winning show. He's just a real treasure, a uh, good friend of many of us on faculty here for a long time and a wonderful uh, career of service to students and uh, to just our whole community. So we're very grateful to have him today, and you're in for a treat as he talks about his piece. Uh, very prolific composer. The Bozeman Symphony is performing Eric's uh, fifth symphony. Is that right this spring? Sixth. The sixth symphony this spring. Sorry about that. Um, and we get to perform a very special piece for you today. Uh, after the fire in the Bridger Foothills in September of 2020, uh, Eric contacted a friend of his, a Pulitzer Prize winning author, Richard Powers, and Eric will tell you more about him and their friendship. Uh, to write a text to commemorate uh, the fire and uh, just in response to it. And then Eric wrote the music and it's entitled Requiem for a Forest. Um, your Montanans, our chamber choir, along with a very fine group of strings uh, led by Angela Ahn, are going to take this piece to Bellevue, Washington in February and perform it uh, for the regional conference of the National Association for Music Education. Uh, taking a very special piece uh, originated right here in the valley that speaks to an important issue uh, certainly in Northwest uh, United States, but really throughout the world is the preservation of our forests and um, I think you'll enjoy the piece today. Please do look at that poem and would you please welcome Eric. Thank you very much. It's really uh, fun to be able to talk to a room full of musicians uh, because we are all involved in a very esoteric enterprise. We're basically creating sound sculptures, putting them in the air where they're traveling and disappearing as they sound. Um, we composers create the blueprint to sort of fashion that thing that was in our mind's ear, and then performers and a, a larger group like the one today, uh, conductors involved, they're trying to actualize exactly the replica of what was once only imagined. So we're taking something out of the inner plane and manifesting it on this plane. And if we're lucky, it's here uh, for as long as it's gonna be here. This piece that they're gonna play for you today, perform for you today, was commissioned by Intermountain Opera. And the whole inception came along pretty quickly. And I'm gonna read you a little bit of information so I don't miss anything. And then I'll share the text with you that my friend Rick Powers created. Um, Rick's an interesting guy and I'll, this will be duplicative of some of what I say in the written remarks, but uh, he won the Pulitzer in 2020 for his book, The Overstory. And his new book is probably gonna end up uh, in similar fashion. He's just a remarkable human being. If you've never read his stuff, uh, it's, it's worth reading. He was living at my place for just about a year while he was working on Overstory, kind of on the down low. But there is a Richard Power Club here at MSU where people who are in, in, interested in literature study him. Um, Michael Sexton used to run that group. So I called Michael and I said, so Rick's here. Do you want him to come to your club meeting? And he said, yeah, we do. Um, but he's really a, a, quite a wonderful person. And ideally, when we go to uh, Bellevue near Seattle, Washington, he'll join me and we'll do some pre-concert 
talking about this whole project. But I wanted to spend a few minutes taking you into the piece and explaining it since we're all musicians here and it kind of gives you a much closer regard than I can do with the usual program notes uh, for a, a sort of a mixed bag audience. So let me take you into this a little bit. My requiem isn't like a normal requiem in that this work is a one movement work that deals with the death and rebirth of a forest, specifically the forest fire in the Bridger Mountains that started September 4th, 2020. The text for my new piece was written by my friend Richard Powers, winner of the 2020 Pulitzer Prize in Literature for his novel, The Overstory, which is about trees. His response to the music I had composed that sought to capture the Bridger Range just 10 minutes from here was in part a response to the word requiem. Here's a direct quote from an email sent to me by him September 25th that speaks to that, quote, I'd send him some music to listen to to kind of give him a sense of how it's gonna work. Feeling your slow, sustained pulse, I created these short lines with fluid meter and slant rhymes to sound like something slow, old, mournful, and sacred. Thinking of what a requiem always has, I thought, of course, of the DS Eric. So my words have both an oblique reference, a day of wrath dissolve in ash, and a direct quote, the amazing Morse to Pavey passage, death and nature will be amazed when the creatures rise again. I had explained that in this piece I was trying to use the concept of requiem as a metaphor for everything that's going on in the world right now. Wildfires and forest fires throughout California, Oregon, Washington, political unrest, COVID-19, etc. I wanted to both capture the grief and despair and the promise of renewal and hope that results from the forest replenishing after fire. As you're aware, certain pine cones only open and go to seed when exposed to the high temperatures created by fire. It's not the end of the forest, but rather a shift in the unfolding life of the forest. As you can tell from that short description, there is a program at play in the music. By that I mean to say that the music is the fire in sound. As you recall, if you listen to the Pasacalia in Dido's Lament from Purcell's opera Dido and Aeneas, a Pasacalia is a repeating bass line that unfolds over many measures over which changing music occurs. I used a Pasacalia in Requiem for the Forest, but my Pasacalia uses all 12 tones in the chromatic scale in a crafted order that feels like it's returning to the starting pitch, but in fact is returning to a tonic slightly higher than where we started. It's an unusual illusion. Each replay of the Pasacalia is a half step higher than the one before, something that results in a gradual lift increase in tension as the music rises, like a fire. It starts with the bass baritone solo voice singing the Pasacalia as if music was the sparks that start a fire. Sopranos come in and join the fire, expand it. Then the altos arrive as the fire grows, and finally the tenors. Each new voice added also sees a new louder dynamic. The piece starts at piano, grows to mezzo piano, to mezzo forte, to forte, and to fortissimo. The music occurring gets dizzier, more complex as the fire spreads, climaxing near the end and then receding finally to a brief amen as the piece ends. The fire goes up. So how do you do something like this? And my composition students, there are still a few of them here in the room, um, know that my approach is a little bit different. I tend to spend an inordinate amount of time just listening to the music in my own imagination and or walking in the forest. It's kind of a, a common behavior for me. And I'm not looking for s literal sounds like birds and the wind in the trees and the babbling brooks and all that stuff. I'm trying to capture the energy. That's what this is. It's a portrayal of the same energy. So after I was asked to write this piece, I made it my point to drive out to the Stone Creek turnaround, which is just a little ways into Bridger Canyon, but clearly where you can really see the path of the fire and where it comes to a stop. And I sat there and just looked at it and just let whatever sounds wanted to come into mind come into mind. And I wrote them down 
And to my surprise, it wasn't intentional, but to my surprise, I realized I'd used all 12 tones in the scale, but not like a Schoenbergian serial 12 tone row per se, because that it's more tonally contrived. So it's not going to sound as intentionally oblique as some serial uh, dodecaphonic lines might. Um, you probably won't even be able to tell that it's 12 tones. The beauty of Schoenberg, as an aside here, is that he was trying to reclassicize music and get back to the ar architectonic purity, the structural purity, because the late Romantic period saw such meanderings and overwrought catharsis that he was trying to get back to some sort of organization of material so that it wasn't um, under threat of, of becoming uh, redundant or too doggerel-like. There are a couple of things that you're going to hear in the choir that I wanted to point out uh, for their benefit as much as yours. One is that there are places where the sopranos are singing a dotted eighth and a quarter while the men are singing a quarter note triplet. So where they're going da di da di, these guys are going di da da. So it's not going to line up intentionally. Because if you've ever seen wildfires burning, they tend to be, they feel like an organized thing, but they're moving at their own rate, at their own speed. There's a place in the piece where they get almost to the end, they start to taper, and then the whole thing blows back up again. Uh, and then finally uh, gets to an amen at the end, which is sort of the fire finally burning up. Here's the poem that you're going to hear. And the reason I wanted to read it to you is because I wrote this piece in a sort of madrigalia style, meaning like a madrigal, so that the words are happening, but they're happening at different times in different parts. So it's not like a homophonic piece where I've got my guitar and singing you a folk song, and you can hear exactly what I'm saying. You've got four different sections who are singing, and they're delivering this text to you, but it's overlaid in the same way that fires overlay. And I will add this little bit of, of information that when I saw the fire start to boil, I was out at Snowfill, which is a dog park, walking my golden retrievers. And I looked up at the Bridgers, and just to the north of the M, there was a smoke plume. And I thought, uh-oh. And then pretty soon, this thing really started to travel and move. Then the second thing came up way above the M, higher. So I decided to even have that little bit of tone painting between us in the piece, starting with the basses and then the sopranos sort of overarching. Here's Rick's poem. In the summer heat and warming world, storms whip up, lightning rolls. Sparks run to earth, the wind turns, through the mountains forests burn. From walls of flame, plumes so wide are seen from space, the west on fire. For pine and spruce, a day of wrath, ancient ones dissolve in ash. Fire ends, yet fire begins as mountains die. Cones open. Mors tu bebit et natura cum resurget creatura, which is Latin for death shall be stunned and nature when creation rises again. Now we must learn how to live here where fire season burns all year. Blackened earth with green renew, may the fires wake us too. So my intention with this piece, uh, originally, I wanted it to be performed um, as often as it possibly could, and not just here with Intermountain Opera. But the idea was to try to get opera companies down the west coast to pull it. And there are a couple of ways that it can be done. You can have one soprano, one contralto or alto, one tenor, one bass, just coming out in front of the proscenium, in front of a closed curtain, and singing it a cappella. Or you can have them sing with a pit orchestra playing. I actually wrote out a whole orchestra part. Or you can have a choir singing it, or the opera chorus from the company. So before or after an opera, they could just do this as a freestanding prelude or an encore. What we're doing now um, with uh, Dr. Amant's group, Montanans, is I've embedded strings in each section. And so I've got a, a first violin and a second violin. Uh, sometimes the second violin is is doubling the alto line. Uh, the first violin is generally running with the sopranos. The violist is carrying sometimes the alto, but the tenor. The cellist is carrying the 
bases mainly, but also the tenor section. And then Victor over here on the double bass, you'll see him in a minute, is the only person who has an independent line. And I realized after the fact, and you composers know what I'm talking about, sometimes we assume that our listening audience is gonna be able to understand what we're implying. But then I realized that without the bass line, my audience probably wouldn't have any sense of the harmony that I thought I was implying. So I added in that uh, other line to sort of give us a line that goes underneath the whole thing and more clearly and overtly states what the harmony is. So that's basically how the piece works. And before I bring these guys out here, um, I thought since I saw the notification about the music major seminar and it said conversations with or about, then I thought I would give you an opportunity if you have any questions. Since we don't have a microphone out there, I'll just repeat your question up here. If you can think of anything that you'd like me to uh, go into more depth or anything you'd like. Anybody out there have a burning question? That has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes? What's your favorite drink? My favorite drink? Right now it's water. <laughs> Anybody else? I used to do this when we had uh, seminars. I would tell my students, I would email them and say, uh, come in with three questions. This is what the thing is going to be about. So they didn't, because I've been in that spot, you know, right after the Civil War when I was in college. Um, people would come in and give these talks, and then uh, they would say, you have any questions? And you're like, I know I must have a question, but I don't know what it is. Back there? What's your favorite part about composing music? What's my favorite part about composing music? Well, it's really my raison d'etre, you know, it's from the time, my reason for being. Um, from the time I was a little kid, I started to realize that the sounds I was hearing in my imagination were not the same sounds that were ubiquitously out here, you know, coming off radios and record players in those days. And, this constant din, and being able to separate that out. So for me, the favorite part about composing is actually trying to accurately extract that which is going on, because it isn't literal. It isn't like I'm hearing a violin playing something. I'm hearing something. And oftentimes, it's so not music that I have to translate it into music. and so. That's probably the most exciting thing on the creative side, is the accuracy of that process. And then of course, one of the questions I get from a lay audience is, did it sound like you thought it was going to? <laughs> yes, of course it did. Because if I've done my job correctly, if you, people know this, that uh, if you write down exactly what it is they're supposed to do and they do that, it's gonna be a, a direct mirror of that. But performances are fun and it still stuns me um, when a conductor does a downbeat, that the musicians actually play. They don't have to. They can say, nah, I'm not gonna do it. Um, but they always do, and I've been very fortunate um, in the fact that my big orchestral works, I've got, I'm working on my 10th symphony right now, and the sixth that they're gonna do this March was written in 2001. One through five have all been recorded, six through nine have not been performed yet, so it'll be a, a world premiere. But I've been very fortunate to this point because my orchestras have been the Czech Philharmonic, the Warsaw Philharmonic, the Latvian National. And to be honest, I was just like you guys. I was born in Deer Lodge, not in the prison, but just up the hill, <laughs> hospital. Um, and I grew up pretty much in Montana and I never would have imagined uh, my career taking me to a situation where I'm in Prague or I'm in Warsaw or I'm in Riga or Russia or wherever else my career is taking me so far. And when you hear an orchestra that's a top flight professional orchestra play something that you've written, it is so identical to the thing that you heard in your head and that you, that you put out there that it's, it's shocking. And that's a rush. And there's just no way around it. Um, I used to conduct my own works, but I found it's even more fun if I'm in the, uh, in the audience. So those two things, the manifestation of the piece and getting it accurate and you go, yes, I got it. Because sometimes it's, so, it's more like hamburgers going to do this. Um, but then the other thing is, is the performance. And I will, I'll add this to that little uh, answer is that this performance coming up, the Sixth Symphony, 
being in Bozeman and knowing most of the players in the orchestra, knowing Norman, the conductor, pretty well, um, and now today with Kirk, you know, Ahmad being a close colleague and a, and a close friend, and these singers, it's so much more personal when you're in your own town. And it, and it sort of adds something, because when I was in, uh, in the Czech Republic or in Hungary or India or wherever else I've been, you know, with this stuff, I go up and I take a bow, but I don't know the people. I don't really know the orchestra. I probably have a relationship with a few soloists and the concertmaster and the conductor, but it's still a little bit distant. So there's an added feature. I hope this is your experience um, that you get to play for or write for and hear play um, your music for friends and family and people that you know. It's a special added attraction. Anything else out there? Yes. Yeah, I mean, Rick and I have become really close friends. It's almost spooky. Um, he's just a really, he's a remarkable human being. This particular collaboration was totally weird because I was sitting with the Inner Mountain Opera Board. They asked me if I would write a piece. I didn't even have a title for it yet. I think Thomas Thomas actually said, why don't you call it Requiem for a Forest? And I thought, what a great idea. Glad I thought of it. Um, but I said to them, I said, do you want me to reach out to my friend Richard Powers and see if he'd be willing to write the text? And they said, seriously? And I said, seriously. So after the meeting, I just picked up my phone and texted him and said, would you be willing to do this? And uh, he wrote back and said, absolutely. So I sent him some music, and the next day, he sent it. And then I just started adjusting the music that I had sent to him so that it started to fit the contours and the phrase shapes of what was going on. So unlike the collaboration that we're working on now, which is really strange, uh, where we're really braiding with each other, we're really working in, in more of a, is that you, Laurie? Mm -hmm. It's more of a collaboration, you know, where we're, we really are dancing together with this, that the music and the words, in other words, some of you have written some folk songs and sometimes you come up with the words first and then you put them to music. Sometimes you come up with the music and you find words for it. In this case, we're simultaneously fashioning this thing. And it's so abstract, I won't even try to explain it to you. I'm not sure I understand what we're doing yet. Anything else out there? Somebody's pointing at that. Hey. Hi. How Hi. did you meet Richard Powers? Um, it was pretty strange. Uh, how did I meet Richard Powers is the question. I was teaching a class on Baroque music for what was then called Wonderlust and now is called Ali. And I had like 70 students in the class. It was a class on Baroque music. And I looked out into the audience, like the third class, and here's this person sitting there who wasn't normally in the group, and he looked an awful lot like Richard Powers. So I, he's a famous guy, you know? And so I took a break at one point, and I walked over and I said, excuse me, and he said, hello. And he said, I, I hope you don't mind me sitting in. My name is Richard Powers. And I said, I thought that was you. Um, and so then I said, uh, maybe we should go out and have coffee if you're going to be around. And he said, that'd be great. Because I said, I have a funny feeling we're going to work on something together. So let's follow that lead. And so he agreed to meet me for coffee. We did collaborate on an early piece. I didn't know that he was working. I didn't know the nature of what he was working on at the time, the overstory, which if you haven't read, it's a life-changing book. It's a must-read. It's brilliant. Um, but it's all about trees and how trees can communicate with each other. And they're sending enzymes through the root systems to out of species, other trees in the forest. The forest is all taking care of each other. It's quite beautiful. Um, but that's how we met. It was very unusual. And then he needed a place to live in Bozeman. And we had an um, ADU on our property that we kind of used as a cabin for family when they come to visit. And so he planted himself down there. And then in the evenings, he'd generally come up and we would play old Eastern European board games that had been moved into English. Uh, yeah, interesting guy. And then the friendship has just gone on. We continue to write. In fact, when he got the, the Pulitzer, I wrote him and I said, boom, holy cow, the Pulitzer. And he said, yeah, you're telling me. I was up in my treehouse when these guys showed up in the forest. Uh, <laughs> 
He lives in the Smoky Mountains now where there are more varieties of hardwood trees than anywhere else in the world. So that's how it started. And I would, I would tell you that you know, don't, don't be shy as, as undergraduate students and musicians. If you are impressed by somebody, reach out to them. Um, I can't tell you the number of times I, when I was teaching here and I would do like masterwork class or a American popular music class and I would be really impressed by somebody. I'd look them up on the web, I'd find their contact number, I'd reach out to them, tell them my experience and nine times out of 10 they write back. Relationships can start. So it's worth following those leads. Don't feel like, oh gee, I'm just me. No, you're not. You're you. All right, uh, anything, anybody else have a? So I think I'll see if Kirk is probably ready to come out. I told him right around 11.30, calling it pretty close. Yeah, come on in. Enjoy this. It's uh, it's quite remarkable. 